So this is a typical American grocery store, and I'm really afraid of it. And by the time I'm done talking, you probably will be too. And not because of pink slime in the meat section or getting measles in the produce section or anything like that. You should be afraid of the cars and trucks because they drive to this grocery store all day, every day. I also drive to the grocery store, and it kills me. So when I have to go to the grocery store, I do this thing I call the green guilt dance. I start thinking, OK, I should go to the corner store. It's a quarter of a mile away. I can walk. But they don't have organic produce. Then I think I could go to the Whole Foods near me, 1.3 miles, but I'd like to be able to pay rent next month. I could go to Berkeley Bowl. I live near there, 2.7 miles, good food, good price. I could totally bike 2.7 miles. I could bike 2.7 miles, but I don't think that biking with 10 pounds of groceries sounds like much fun. I could take the bus maybe, but that's 45 minutes. Maybe I should order one of those organic produce boxes that comes in the mail, but that won't be here till Friday. Some nights I get so agonized by this decision that I end up just eating gluten-free cereal for dinner and not even going. <laughs> but most nights I fold and I drive. And you might think, OK, a little too much agony with the driving to the grocery store. But the thing is, I know too much. I know more about people driving to the grocery store than possibly anyone in the United States of America. And I promise that it is worth being afraid of, because cars and trucks are scary. They're scary because they kill 40,000 Americans a year. They're scary because we will all probably spend over four years of our life inside a car. And they're scary because they contribute 30% of America's greenhouse gas emissions. And if you're Californian, as I am, it's probably 70% of your greenhouse gas emissions. 70%. And a third of those miles traveled are for going to buy stuff, like groceries. And that is ridiculous, and it's also scary. And when I started to learn this, I started to get even more scared because I realized that the environmental community is not paying that much attention to it. In fact, no one is paying that much attention to it. There is a really unbelievable data gap when it comes to transportation. We don't know who's driving on those roads and where they're going and how far. It's really a blank map with a Whole Foods in the middle. That's the Arden Plaza Whole Foods just down the street. And that blank map is what should terrify you. And it terrified me. So with a few friends, I started a company called Streetlight Data. And we started collecting data from smartphones, from dumb phones, from burner phones, from navigation devices, all kinds of data coming together to create a comprehensive picture of what's happening, of transportation behavior anywhere in the United States. It took a long time, three years. It took millions of dollars. It took a lot of negotiations with some very big and scary companies. It took 15 amazing teammates. And it took so much heartbreak and so many setbacks, uh, more than I care to remember. But now, I can do that. That is a picture of all the trips that went to the Arden Plaza Whole Foods a couple days last year. It's pretty exciting. The red lines are personal cars. The blue lines are the commercial trucks that deliver the food. And you can see them all converging on that green star in the center. And building on data like this, I can create new types of metrics, like this map. This map shows you the home neighborhoods of everyone who shopped at that Whole Foods over the past year. It's a simple heat map. Red means more people live in that neighborhood who shop at the Whole Foods. But it's pretty exciting in terms of a data leap forward. And this is where the big data halo effect kicks in, where we say, now, now we have all this data about something really important. Now things are going to change. That's what I thought when I started. Everything will get better immediately, right? Wrong. Big data does not change anything. People using big data might change things if they're very smart, very lucky, and very good at their jobs. So to illustrate, I'm going to show you a few cool things that could be done with this map based on projects that smart people have done with our data in the past. So first, let's talk about this neighborhood, Pink Box. 8% of the shoppers at the Whole Foods live in that neighborhood. And it's close by, only a mile away. Immediately, the transportation planner in me thinks biking. They should bike. And maybe it's a great opportunity for a bike lane. But we've already talked about some of the problems with biking and groceries. And what if you have kids? You can't take two kids and 10 pounds of groceries on the bike. More importantly, it is just the mile they're driving. So I'm not really that concerned with those drivers. I'm more concerned with these people up here. 14% of the shoppers live eight miles away. And that's about a 20-minute drive, which is pretty long for going to the grocery store. So we might think, 
what are those people doing? Maybe they really love Whole Foods. Or maybe there's not that many options for them. So here I see an opportunity to make money and to save some carbon. Someone should put an organic fancy grocery store up there. You know the market's there, you're gonna make money, and more importantly, it will be convenient for the shoppers and they will drive less. Commercial real estate is functionally making most of the land use decisions in America. And we spend a huge amount of time doing advocacy about land use in public policy. We need to apply that energy to private policy, to personal commercial real estate decisions, just as aggressively. All right, one more neighborhood, because I think it's a really interesting one. Down here. Now, 9% of the shoppers at the Whole Foods live in that neighborhood, which to me was strange, because there's a ton of grocery stores there. Why are they going to this Whole Foods? Why are they skipping other options? Well, we found the reason when we went a little deeper. What I'm showing you now is the map of the work locations of the Whole Foods shoppers. So we see that a lot of people are actually near the Whole Foods because it's near their office. So maybe they are making a reasonable, sustainable decision. It's also near other shopping destinations, maybe some leisure. So what I see here is an opportunity for transit. There's so much car exchange between those neighborhoods, great opportunity for a bus that would be highly used. Now there's a lot more interesting use case I could talk all day. We haven't even talked about the freight, which is really interesting. But I wanna answer first a question that I'm imagining is trickling around in the back of your mind, which is, did that girl just follow me going to the grocery store? <laughs> I'm not sure I'm okay with that. So there's a long answer to that question, but the short answer is no, I did not follow you going to the grocery store. We do not follow you or any individual. We look at the network. And I know that this data can be alarming, and that's because it's powerful. And anything that's powerful can be used for good, and it can be used for harm. And we need good leadership and good policy to mitigate the harm this data can do, but we also desperately need the good it can do because there is no solution to climate change without a radical reduction in transportation emissions. And if we don't start measuring it, we're never gonna be able to manage it. So I wanna close with a few examples of ways that my behavior has changed since I got so over-informed about transportation and the environment. First, there are two decisions that you make that will determine your carbon footprint, only two. Where you live and what kind of car you buy if you choose to buy a car. If you take it easy on those two decisions, if you live a little further outside of town for the view, if you go for that lower MPG car because it's a little cheaper, maybe you like the pickup, then no amount of organic broccoli and LEDs and cloth bags at the grocery store and cute solar panels to charge your iPhone on your backpack, none of that will matter. It will not make it up. Get those two decisions right. And then you can relax a little bit on the other stuff. Two, when I started in green transportation, I had this vision. And the vision, it was sort of beautifully drawn, and there was pedestrians with a dog, and there were bikes, and there was a really cool futuristic monorail going down the center of the city. And I thought that's what green transportation was. I thought that's where we needed to head. But I've discovered that the truth is not quite that beautiful. There's a few ugly pieces. In particular, ugly piece number one, we waited too long in America. We do not have time to make our cities walkable, bikeable, transitable at the level we need before we run into some serious climate problems. So we have to find a vision and policy for the future that acknowledges the fact that most Americans are still gonna have cars and still gonna drive them. That's not a pretty thing for someone as impassioned about green transportation as I am to admit. And the second ugly truth is that a lot of the green transportation policies that are being pushed appropriately in cities around America, some of them have a huge disproportionate impact on low-income people. And that sucks. And to ignore those facts and to not acknowledge and deal with those facts, I think is not productive in making the changes we want to see in the world. And since I've learned to admit and talk about them, I've become a more effective advocate for change. And the third thing is something I'm calling the Lake Tahoe fallacy. So when I explain what I do at a cocktail party, say, people immediately go into green confession mode and they start explaining their transportation choices to me, which is fine because it's a good conversation to have. But there's this phrase that's been coming up over and over again, especially with younger people. They say to me, oh, well, I have a car, but I only use it for outdoor adventures on the weekend. So, so let me remind you that Mother Nature does not care if you're driving to go admire her. You do not get some sort of green bonus points. Plus, those outdoor adventures tend to be kind of far away, and the length of the trip really matters. So to illustrate, 
I live in Oakland, California, and I work in San Francisco, 11 miles each way. I take BART. I could instead drive to work every day for two months, or I could go to Lake Tahoe once. Same carbon. So that brings me back to that grocery store agony this week. Maybe it was a little silly to obsess that much about a 2.7 mile trip, especially when I have a nice electric car. But while going to the grocery store on Wednesday may not be that big a deal, I also had to confront going up to Sacramento to give a speech about green transportation on a Saturday. <laughs> That's a bigger deal. That's the one you should worry about. But today, I got lucky. No green agony dance. I took Amtrak. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.